Welcome to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters of public health. This week, we continue our series of looking at education. Last week, we talked to public health nurse, Gina Lopez, about um, opening the schools. And this week, we'll turn our attention to some really interesting initiatives that are going on in our community that are supporting education. Why do we look at education when we're talking about public health? Well, when we look at public health, we can't just look at health care and health access. We have to look at the social determinants of health and those things that help uplift our community and ensure the well-being of those citizens in our community. So we look at things like education, income, employment, neighborhoods, and um, finally, we also look at housing. I may have said that, um, but we do look at all of those things because they contribute to the well-being of our community. So today we are fortunate to have Mike Apfelberg from the United Way join us. Uh, Mike is the president of the United Way for the greater Nashua area, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure. We're going to be talking a lot about what the United Way has been doing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but also talking about some of the upcoming initiatives that you're undertaking of regards to education. Um, because as we are trying to emphasize that education is so important in our communities, it supports not only the children, but the parents so that they can go back to work and feel confident um, that they're making the right decisions as um, we all adjust to a new normal here. So tell me a little bit about the United Way and your staff and um, sure. I'm very struck about how much you do and how few people actually work in your office. Well, the, first of all, Jane, thank you for having me on today. I really appreciate the, the time. Um, second of all, I would say I really liked your introduction because you talk about the social determinants of health. And um, I would say your boss, Bobby, and my colleague, Liz, have taught me more about these concepts about the social determinants than probably anybody else. And, you know, Liz, is, she said, well, Mike, you know, it's all health when it comes down to it. What is not health? And if you think about it deeply, you know, it can all be tied back to, you know, healthy outcomes in life are a function of where we live, who we interact with, um, how, you know, how we live. It's not the doctors and, and the nurses and, the, and the, 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 the medications and the surgeries. That's part of it, but honestly, it's a small part of it. And we found that really that's about 10%. Yeah. So tell us what yeah. the United Way is. Yeah. Are you really a health so, agency now then? We're not really a health <laughs> agency, but we're all health agencies. Right. I guess that's what I'm saying. So you asked about our staff. First of all, thank you for asking. This is the first week when I've actually seen my staff back in the office. We do have a small staff. There are really only four of us who are full-time at United Way. And we also have one part-time administrative um, support person. So we're a small, we're a small organization. Um, I like to think of us as small but mighty because we are, you remember how Dunkin' Donuts used to have the little slogan, America runs on Dunkin' Donuts? Well, we run on volunteers. And I'll tell you over the last couple of months with our COVID response, just in this short compressed period of time since March, we've had roughly 400 volunteers that have logged well over 8,000 hours of volunteerism. So when it it's a question of, you know, sort of getting the work done that we do. It's leveraged heavily through a volunteer base. Which is a community yeah. effort in of itself. It, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. I was really proud. You know, the city has been tracking some of the volunteer hours and from all of the agencies in the community. And the United Way volunteers have actually logged somewhere between half and two-thirds of all of the hours wow. in the community. So it's been, it's been a heavy lift, but it's been really very gratifying. That's great. So, so that you did during the um, COVID response. Can well, Let's step back. Is you it did, not still the COVID response? It is, still is. It still is. We're still in it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't know we were done. Yeah. No, we're not done. But yeah. when you initially yeah. started that, you had to take some measures. I mean, you, you guys have done so much and distributed so many things. Yeah. So just tell me, I guess we'll back up to the volunteers. Um, how did you keep them safe? Because yeah, so, some people were very reluctant um, to volunteer. Sure, absolutely. So one, one of the things we did with volunteers from the very get-go, and I felt horrible about doing this, but from the beginning, very beginning of March when it looked like we were going to need a really heavy volunteer engagement, we um, limited our volunteers to people who were under 60 years old. And that was a really hard thing to do because we're used to having a lot of seniors who like to give back through their, through their, their, their time and their energy. And we really appreciate that. 
but we felt like it was really important for their safety uh, that they that they not be engaged in our volunteer efforts. So, you know, when we started out, the big initial volunteer effort that we started out was around uh, helping the school district to distribute breakfasts and lunches. Okay. And that has, you know, over the past couple of months, concluding actually last week was our was our final week before the district took back over the program entirely. We distributed over 90,000 breakfasts and lunches. Wow. And we were doing that in, um, at one point, 13 different schools and on four different bus routes, serving a total of about 28 different locations around the city three days a week. And there must have been some other agencies involved with you. There were a bunch of agencies, okay. and that's the other Let's trick. Let's give a to, little shout out to them, maybe. We too. will do that. So that's, yeah. a, that's the trick in Nashua is um, nothing happens if we don't all pitch in. It's a great community for collaboration. So we had, um, you know, the cooperative effort included not just the school district preparing the food, the transit system providing the buses, United Way volunteers providing the sort of the public facing um, distribution system, but we also had the National Soup Kitchen and Shelter that was providing um, produce and frozen meals as a supplement to the food. Um, we also had the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA that were providing services to actually use their vans and volunteers and their employees to get the food from point A to point B. So food that was prepared at Nashua High School North would be brought down to Elm Street by a Boys and Girls Club van. Um, produce that was supplied by the soup kitchen shelter picked up by a YMCA van and brought out to one of those locations. So big collaborative effort. Yeah, and you um, really have to be because everything's be. coming from no everywhere. Question. So it's like a big spider web of going out to all the different schools and it making is. sure that people had what they needed. And it, it, abs absolutely. And, you know, I don't have vans and nobody else had those volunteers and the school district has the food and the locations. And so it really does take everybody partnering together. And just so, backing up with yeah. those school meals, just to um, recognize that it's so important that kids have um, that nutrition yep. and that access to food because oftentimes they are relying up upon the schools, um, whether, you know, it's during the school year or even during the summer, there have been some programs. Yeah, absolutely. All summer long, we've continued to run the program as well. Um, Southern New Hampshire Services also plays a significant role in the summer food program, the, the component from, say, you know, we they weren't really involved up until sort of mid-June, but from mid-June to um, you know, beginning of September, end of August, they were involved in a bunch of locations themselves. So then it became a partnership where they were doing part of it, we were doing part of it, the school district was doing part of it, and again, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA in the soup kitchen as well. So um, yeah, food is really important. Um, we're pretty excited also that the, the USDA has chosen to extend their waiver for, um, for districts all across the country through the end of December to provide really free breakfasts and lunches to any student. In the you don't have to qualify. If right. you're a student, you can just go get a breakfast or oh, lunch. Oh, so now you're explaining something that I wondered about because as my teenagers went back to school, they said breakfast and lunch were free this breakfast, year. And, and I they said, were not oh, lying. They did yeah, not make I know. that up. That's <laughs> I, was true. I was uncertain. I'm like, oh, that's nice. But, and that's um, across every district in the United well, States. So that's really, that is a, a great thing also to you know ensure it really the is. health of our children. So beyond food, uh, we have this amazing infographic that they'll post while we're talking. Sure. Um, but, I mean, there was toilet paper and there yeah, was, tell well, us what else. And where so, did you put all of that stuff, Mike? Because <laughs> well, their offices are not very big. Well, first of all, I kicked all of our employees out. Everybody went home, and so that created some space. Um, we do have a small office. You're right about that. But I was really the only person in the office. Four days a week, I would be in the office, and my colleague Sarah would come in one day a week, and I would work from home that one day a week. But it was just the two of us. Like, there was never more than one person in the office. So early on in the pandemic, we realized that we have a lot of nonprofit partners who were really struggling with personal protective equipment and also, you know, hand sanitizers, sanitizing wipes, toilet paper. You know, we all remember the great toilet paper yes. fiasco of 2020. <laughs> Um, so my, we kind of redeployed and we said, I said to my colleague Liz, she became sort of the one person procurement department for all the nonprofits in our community. And I said, Liz, here's the thing. 
this ain't your job normally, but this is our job now. We need toilet paper. Can you go find me some toilet paper? And she just picked up the phone and she called every place, every school, every supply store, not school supply store, every like paper goods supply store. She called hotels who were closing down. Have you got extra? She called BJ's and Costco's and every other place. We got toilet paper. We started making hand sanitizer. And we did that with gin spirits up on Amherst Street. But gallons and gallons and gallons of hand sanitizer that we packaged into bottles and redistributed to our nonprofits. We found um, gloves, uh, you know, rubber gloves for, for people. Um, so we, we just, just started, we became sort of the backbone for the nonprofits because they had a job to do to serve their clients. And they didn't have the bandwidth or the time to, to really deal with this important aspect of sourcing product. And so we just said, you know what? We can do that. Yeah, Somebody's got to do it. It Might really well is. Us. It is a great network of support yeah. because then they can go back and do their work safely in right. their environments. And I right. can't emphasize that enough working in, in my own, so, so to speak, yeah. for the city, but in my own nonprofit where you do need that stuff. You do need the Absolutely. gloves, you do need, and uh, masks. I mean, you guys distributed over 80,000 masks, you said? Um, actually, as of today, 91 and a oh, half thousand excuse masks. me, 91 and a thousand, and yeah. 91,000. So, so yeah, masks became a big deal. Where we really got into the mask business was when, the, when retail started to open up. So retail in Nashua opened up um, and the malls opened up. And Simon Malls reached out to us and said, um, well, they said, what can we do to, to help you with the work you're doing? And I said back to them, what can we do to help you? And what they said was, well, we're opening the Pheasant Lane Mall and the Merrimack Premium Outlets. Um, we'd like to make sure that everybody who comes has an opportunity to have a mask while they're shopping so they feel safe. And so they are safe and they keep our employees safe as well. And so we, we rounded up the volunteers and we found ourselves thousands of masks and we, for the first three weeks that the malls were open, we were at every entrance, all hours when they were open, um, distributing face masks. Wow. And that was just our first foray into it. That was about 20-ish thousand masks that we distributed Just 20,000. <laughs> it was a lot, but yeah. And then we started distributing masks downtown at a couple of different locations, a couple of days a week. Um, we also, of course, are distributing to all of the nonprofits in the community. Um, on a regular basis. We also started distributing masks through the food program and then through the farmer's market. Right. So we actually have a, one of our alder women, Trish Klee, alder woman from Ward 3, who every Sunday is there at the farmer's market with another one of our volunteers, Colleen, and they're handing out face masks to the public. And so, and that's about a thousand a week. So that's a, that's it's excellent. A lot. That's great. And it's really important to wear yeah. those masks. It is. Can't emphasize enough. We have a mask ordinance in Nashua, yeah. and it really is source control for this virus. Uh, Mike and I are not wearing them right now, but we are six feet apart. Uh, just want to emphasize. But yes. we do have them. And I do appreciate that you brought me my own United Way mask. Well, so. I saw you had a City of Nashua mask. I mean, yeah. everybody needs a United Way mask. That's right. Important. It's true. So, so um, this is amazing work, but I really yeah. want to get to um, what's coming what's down next, the pike right? because schools are back in session yeah. and you have this amazing initiative called Learn United. Yep. And um, you really have this, this brainchild of yours yeah. has really come up um, because of the summer slide. And we've had more That's than right. a summer slide this year. We've had um, a summer you know, slide on steroids right. this year. So we've had kids out of school basically yeah. since March. Now they were learning remotely, but we all know that remote learning is not really replacing in-person yeah. learning. So there has been a slide. Yeah. And so tell so, us about Learn United. So really this came about as a result of a couple of conversations I was having with people about what's the school you're gonna look like. And one of those conversations was with my daughter who is a middle school, she, she's embarrassed when I talk about her, but we want to anyway, because she's my kid and I'm, that's what we do, right? Absolutely. So she's a guidance counselor at Penichuk Middle School. And she's um, responsible for the seventh graders this year. And she was talking with her colleagues and they're concerned because, you know, especially the incoming class of sixth graders, think about it, they effectively really didn't even have much of a fifth grade, let alone a step up day and the time to prepare for sixth grade they will not, they're just like coming in as if they really last school year kind of didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of learning loss to deal with. And, 
you know, it really made me mad to think that we would, you know, we won't do everything as a community that we can to support these kids. Um, I don't think I don't think we need to sort of be victims of coronavirus in this environment. I think we can come together and support them in every way we can. And from my perspective, the best way to support these kids is to support the teachers who've identified what their learning gaps are. So starting in October, what we're building is a large scale, for lack of a better word, homework club. We're not really calling it that, but it's kind of like you have your homework and you don't know how to do it. So that means that there's a gap in your knowledge and your learning. So if we match you up with a tutor, who can help you because they understand that area, then they can prepare you and help you with your homework and other academic needs. So we're recruiting at this point f roughly four to 500 volunteer tutors across a variety of academic disciplines, everything from you know social studies to, to English to math. Math. <laughs> math. Don't forget math. <laughs> Everybody's favorite. There's always a big slide on math. Yeah, lots of algebra <laughs> two needs, right? Um, and of course, across a variety of languages, because we are the most diverse community in the state, and we need to be able to do these things in Spanish and in Portuguese and in Swahili and French. So it's important that we have a wide variety of tutors with a wide variety of skills academically and also a language background. We're recruiting from the ranks of retired teachers a lot, but we also have just a lot of community volunteers stepping forward and saying, yeah, I'm interested, count me in, I wanna be a tutor. Um, what we're gonna do, is take referrals from teachers themselves. So let's say Mrs. Jones has a student, she's a third grade teacher, she has a student who's struggling with, with her math and needs, needs help with a tutor. So Mrs. Jones would refer that student to this program, we'll match them up with a tutor. The tutor, in turn, will work with that student at one of our youth agencies in the community. So this is again a collaboration. We've brought in every youth serving organization in the community, which includes the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, the Police Athletic League, Girls Incorporated, the Youth Council, Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and the 21st Century Nashua After School Program. Wow. I think I got everybody there. And it's just the city of Nashua then? Well, of course we would open it up to other districts, but the biggest need we identify is probably going to be in the city of Nashua because we have the largest district. It's got the most moving parts. and It's just harder to manage remote learning in a big complicated district like ours. So there's that. Big tutoring effort. I would estimate we might end up serving as many as four or five thousand students. Wow. Um, and we're going to do this starting mid-October through the end of the year. And how are you getting the word out to the teachers that this is available? Um, well, working? it's through the district. Okay. So we're working, so we're collaborating also with the district. They're part of the planning. The first phone call I made, actually, when, 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 when I had the thought to implement this was to my friend Adam, who's the teachers union president, run it past him. He said, yeah, you know what? That's actually a pretty good idea. We'd like to do that. And then I called my friend Gail over at 21st Century Nashville, who's in the district. And she said, that's great. Let's get Assistant Superintendent Garth McKinney on board. We brought him in, and then it just grew from there. Excellent, excellent. And there's other pieces to this, too. Um, we do know that there are a sizable number of kids who do not have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. And because we have a district that has a fairly sizable number of people who are low income. Um, so we've taken it on ourselves at United Way to purchase mobile hotspots that we're distributing out, again, through referrals from teachers and guidance counselors. Um, initially, I've bought 100 hotspots that have unlimited data where you just basically take the device home, you plug it in, you push the button, turn it on, it connects to the internet. You have unlimited data that we've purchased. Um, you can connect up to 15 devices to your hotspot wirelessly. So a family that has four kids, four laptops, four Chromebooks, whatever the case may be, but no internet, they can connect. Okay. Um, now what if they don't have the laptop? Because that's also a concern. Well, that's a concern as well. So we're also building a what I'm calling a school supply and technology pantry. Mm -hmm. Think of it like a, like a uh, pantry at the soup kitchen, but instead of going there to get uh, food, you come to us to get everything from backpacks and notebooks and pencils to laptops and tablets. We've already received somewhere around 25, 30-ish tablets, notebooks, used laptops, um, and we have a, a team of volunteers, a tech team, that is refurbishing those computers, basically stripping them down to 
to the point where they really only have one thing on it, and that's a browser. And that's all you need, because most of the tutoring that we're going to do is via Zoom okay. or in person. But kids need to be able to log on to their Google Classroom. So there are kids that are families that have three and four kids that only have one, one Chromebook. And so they need maybe an additional one, and that's what that's for as Great. well. So there are supplies available. What if I'm a parent wanting to get in, involved in this program? Do I have to go through my teacher? Or? Yeah, so we're definitely not taking direct referrals. We're trying not to, at least. You know, these things always, there's always exceptions. Everything has exceptions. But what we're trying to do is work through the, through the district and through the teachers and through the guidance counselors. Because really, if you think about it, that Mrs. Jones, she's the one who knows what her students' needs are, what the academic expectations are, and where the shortcomings are. So we really want to make sure that she's in the loop on the referral, um, the resources, that she knows what the hurdles are that the student is facing. We're there to help solve those problems, but we want to make sure that the teacher is absolutely in that loop from the front of the process. So that's why we're really relying on them for referrals. If you're a parent, and you, and you think your student need, needs help, talk to your teacher about Learn United and see how you might be able to refer them. Mm -hmm. That would be my best answer. All right, great. Um, so what else do you need to make this successful? Here's the big ask. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, money would be good. Um, <laughs> that's always part of it. Technology donations, so, those but, kind yeah, of things. Absolutely, we're looking for funding, we're looking for technology donations. We're, all, we're looking for volunteers, we're looking for, um, you know, and, and we're looking, frankly, for families who think that there's a need and might want to talk with their teacher about referring them. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really all of the above. There's no way that you can offer help that I won't say yes. There's no, because there's nothing that we're doing that that is com what we have completely covered. Um, you know, we're kind of, I'll be honest, we're inventing this from scratch, mm -hmm. and it's a big effort, and it's you know, it's 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 hard enough to invent something at all. But it's really hard to invent something big in real time mm -hmm. and make it work. Right, to build the airplane while you're flying. That's kind of exactly thing. what we're doing. And I think a lot of communities and community um, organizations are doing that in this in this time of this pandemic because Absolutely. we really have to think on our feet and we have to be flexible. And right. you know, you may have it envisioned one way, and then you get to the reality is that it doesn't work. But then you just make an adjustment, and that's yeah. what we have to be flexible right now. Yeah, and what I should also say is that what we're not doing is we're not replacing a lot of the programs that are already in place at our at our partner agencies. You know, the Y has a fantastic academic program that they're running throughout the school year. The Boys and Girls Club has the same. Girls Incorporated has the same. They have their programs that are already in place. The problem is, if you take all of those programs and put them all together and add up their capacity, it ends up being around 800 to 850 students that they can serve in a normal year. This is not a normal year. We're going to have a lot more than 800 to 850 students in need, and we have this, this, this additional layer of need for, for technology, need for Internet access. So the program is being sort of... When I, when I picked up the phone and started calling around, I said, guys, I'm not asking you to stop what you're doing. I'm asking you to do something more. Than what right, you're doing. to add to what you're doing, really. Yeah. Everybody loves getting that phone call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not busy enough. They're but. screening it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're busy, but we're doing good stuff, and we're really enjoying it. Yeah, it sounds great. So Learn United, if you want to get more involved, we're going to pop that email up on the screen. I believe it's info at unitedway.org. Info at unitedwaynashua.org. Oh, unitedwaynashua.org. And there's also a, on our web page, if you click onto on our home pages, there's a big old button right in the middle that says COVID-19 response. You click on that, there's a sub page that talks just about Learn United. Has a little snippet from the, the, the piece that was on MUR yesterday. Um, I think we're going to be in the union leader this weekend, so I'll put that up there as well so people can just sort of get a sense for what it's about. Great. So you're well on your way. I wish yeah. you all the luck in the world. Thank and you, I hope that those kids learn because, again, that summer slide and yeah, the important. times we're in, we still have to keep feeding our brains. It's important and, um, for sure. And so um, we appreciate that. We appreciate all that your small but mighty agency is doing in our community and all the coordinating. And um, hopefully we can have you back on and we can get an update maybe sometime in the spring. It would always be my pleasure. I would love to do that. Um, and I really appreciate you bringing me on to talk about some of this stuff. Um, 
And if you're a nonprofit and you'd still need help and support, we're still doing all the things that we've been doing all along also with, with support for PPE and supplies. And we've also been making grants to our local nonprofit um, partners. We've made over 50 emergency grants since the beginning of the, of the COVID crisis. Um, that's still a process which is open as well. So if people have emergency expenses and they're a nonprofit and they haven't applied already, they should reach out to us as well for that. All right. Well, sounds great. So that's info at unitedwaynashua.org, and we'll be back in a few. We've always been interconnected. Interdependent. United. And that's never been more apparent than right now. What we do together today will determine how we live united tomorrow. Stay home. Stay strong. And if you're able, give for your neighbors who need help the most. Public Health Matters. We have another guest today. Pamela Davies is joining us from the Nashua School District and the City of Nashua. You split your time um, talking about another educational initiative in our community that we're so fortunate to have in Nashua, small city, getting some mighty grants here. So first of all, tell us, um, Pamela, what you do for the school district and, and your role um, seeking out some funding. Um, yes, I am the grant writer for both the City of Nashua and for the Nashua School District. It's the um, first time there's been a split position like that. And so I've been working for the city and the school since December of 2019, um, an all new position. Um, and what I do is I just try to identify um, funding needs and funding that exists and how those two can come together and join us in Nashua and fund programming that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Right. So you've had to be at home now since the um, COVID pandemic, um, which really you weren't in your role very long before you kind of went remote, mm -hmm. um, but you were able to seek out a lot of different um, options, it sounds like, while you were. Yeah, it's been great, actually. Um, you know, honestly, ramping up while being so new and then going home, actually, in some cases, being home uh, and working through Zoom allowed me to meet more people and uh, make connections more quickly than I think I would have if I'd been in the office. So it's oh. been great. Well, there you go. So that's great. So the initiative that um, you have been working on and that we're really here to talk about today is called the um, Waterford Upstart Program. Mm -hmm. So um, it's part of a, a larger grant. So I'll, I'll let you take it away on, on what the grant is mm -hmm. and who it addresses. Uh, well, this is the preschool development grant that the United Way just received from the University of New Hampshire and it came down through the Federal uh, Health and Human Services. Um, and what the grant is funding that we're talking about today, the part that we're talking about is called Waterford Upstart and it's a fully remote um, at home kindergarten readiness program for Greater Nashua's four year olds. And initially when we heard about this grant and heard and saw what you could do with it, this is one of the preferred programs that was offered. And with COVID, it's just such a perfect fit because it's all remote um, and kids and their parents can work together on it from home. And it just, it allows the children to go through, it's not preschool, but it's, you know, for preschool age children mm -hmm. to prepare them for kindergarten. So let's back up because mm -hmm. a lot of people say, well, preschool, like why, you know, New Hampshire's still kind of a little bit of a live free or die kind of thing. Why is this important? Why is it important at preschool age to have this educational program? Mm -hmm. Well, when you focus on children, the younger they are, the effects can be cumulative or they can snowball. And so by offering this way of sort of leveling the playing field, um, we allow the kids to start at a higher level than they would have without this program. And those effects will be felt throughout their education. So um, you said it's for four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And um, so just tell us what the program entails. You mentioned technology, you mentioned remote. Mm -hmm. How does that work with a four-year-old? That, well, that's a good question. Um, well, one thing about the program uh, is each family receives a free laptop. Um, and so that's huge. So that kind of removes that digital divide issue and every kid who enters it is on the same 
foot in terms of whether or not what they're using is going to work with the program. So we're talking about like, you know, preschool and how to, why is it important and how are the um, preschool families gonna access this and what does the program involve? Mm -hmm. So first we have the, the free laptop um, and then I believe it's something about 15 minutes a day, what the program yep. is. And so the, what the program will look like if you're a family who is participating is 15 minutes a day, five days a week is all that is required. And that's gonna be a personalized literacy program with optional science and math activities. And when I say optional science and math activities, what Waterford Upstart was finding is that um, children who do the 15 minutes a day of just the literacy part, they want more. They'll go back and they'll, they'll wanna do more of the program because it's fun for them. And uh, so in these 15 minutes a day, the children will progress in a way that's personalized to them. So as they do well, they'll get harder problems or it, it just, so I said personalized about yeah. eight times, but I mean it, and that's yeah. why. So is there an instructor on the other side of the computer, or is it? It's, a so uh, it's software. It's software, It is. Okay. Um, there is some personalized coaching that goes on, um, but that's primarily for the parents. Mm -hmm. So the family receives the laptop, and and then they can go to the United Way maybe to get a hotspot mm -hmm. if they don't have the Actually, technology. Actually, internet or, is okay. also included. Okay, um, So Fabulous. if a family doesn't have internet, internet will be provided for the length of the program, which is, I believe, nine months. So, and, uh, you know, just when they enroll, they'll be asked, you know, do you have internet access? If they do not, then they will set that up with them. They will have someone come and install it. All right. So how many uh, four-year-olds do we estimate are in the greater Nashua area that might be eligible for this program? Well, we did the math figuring out um, how many kids in Nashua um, receive free or reduced lunch and then um, how big our uh, ELL or English language learner population is in the schools. Mm -hmm and um, just sort of estimated uh, 220 kids. Um, and so that's the number of spots that we funded. Uh, the problem though is that enrollment is difficult because you have to, you have to find the families and you have to get them to enroll themselves. And uh, so we may not uh, fill all of those with just Nashua. And so we decided um, that since we're working with the United Way um, and the Smart Start Coalition, which is a group of um, basically community stakeholders who um, deal with uh, this population or kids or, and um, so <laughs> um, by working together, we uh, will enroll as many as we can from Nashua, but we decided why not branch out? Cause the Smart Start Coalition includes other school districts. It includes Milton and Amherst, I believe. Or Milford. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm from Massachusetts. <laughs> and. Um, but then we said, why not all of Greater Nashua? Like, just let's enroll as many kids as we can because it's the kids who need this program, um, and we just want to we want to make it available to whoever is interested in enrolling. Right. So through the Smart Start Coalition, you can take some referrals, um, and hopefully, people listening today can and can refer some of their families. Do, does a family just call themselves? How do, how do you enroll in the program? The parent or the guardian of the enrolling child is the person who needs to do it. Um, and so there's, I can give a phone number. And, sure, you know, okay. absolutely, so now's your chance. I have to chance. look it up. <laughs> okay, so to enroll, you can call one eight eight eight. Is that too many eights? That was three eights. That was good, one eight eight eight. Yep, <laughs> nine eight two nine eight nine eight. Or you can go to waterfordupstart.org slash register. And that will get the ball rolling and someone will work with you. Great. Um, so you did mention um, refugee, immigrant, English as a second language, um, how, how are you going to target those um, organizations uh, beyond Smart Start? Mm -hmm. Well, we're working with basically anyone who has access to um, these families and who knows how to contact them and tell them about this program. We've had flyers printed in several languages, uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, Swahili, um, several others that I'm now forgetting. Um, but Waterford Upstart is very knowledgeable in terms of um, dealing with uh, second lang other languages. And they can, um, any, anyone who's calling them, they, they have an interpreter on hand and any of the parent coaching that goes on, also same, it can be done in any language wow. that the families come at them with. They haven't found one yet that they haven't been able to cover. So this is really an amazing opportunity, especially for our uh, refugee and immigrant families that are 
really trying to adjust to life here mm -hmm. and um, you know the learning the language and getting involved in education and and I think young children probably learn the language faster mm -hmm. so giving them this exposure early on will really help them when they do start school right. in the, um, the following year. That's true and also one thing that's great about the program is in addition to the children who will be using it if there are other people in the home who are learning English as a second language they provide additional licenses for those families and um, other people in the household. Even though they may be older, this programming is still um, applicable to them and they can learn English right alongside their children. Well, so I was just going to ask that there must be a benefit for the parents as well. Not only English um, learning um, families, but other families too. There's a benefit to learning how to use the technology mm -hmm. and I would imagine there are other um, learning benefits as well. Absolutely, parents. and not just those, but the best part for the families is that this program is not just for the children. There's a coaching component for the families where once a week, a personalized coach, an actual person that they'll go through the entire time with, will be contacting them to go over any problems they're having with the program, any problems they're having otherwise that's impacting their ability to go through the program. And I mean, that can be anything from, you know, their internet's not working or, um, you know, they might have to move and things like that. These things can all be dealt with by the coach. And the biggest part though, is they offer uh, ideas for offline enrichment. Mm -hmm. um, they encourage the families and the parents to see themselves as their child's coach and mentor throughout their education. And a lot of the coaches are parents who went through the program previously and they match them with um, families who are going through it now. And so there's a lot of empathy there. And also just these parents report that, you know, they didn't have the same the confidence that they had at the end of it. By the end of the program, they saw themselves as their child's advocate, really, going through their educational process as the kids age and get older. And um, I mean, that's a really powerful tool Absolutely. to have for parents and for families. Um, yeah, just getting they weren't necessarily thinking about getting involved with the school, but then when they have all this confidence that they've gone through this year long program with their child and they've been so successful. Um, they find themselves wanting to get involved in the PTA or, you know, just being willing to speak up to their children's teachers and advocate for their child, really. So you mentioned that a lot of these um, parents or the coaches are alum of the program. Mm -hmm. So how long has this program been going on? That I don't actually know. It started in Utah okay. with uh, the, um, their goal was to reach all of Utah's children. And, uh, but then they just started branching out to other states that had a need for it. Okay, so it must so. be very tried and true if we have mm -hmm. alum as coaches. So we do have that um, software piece, but then you also have that personalized piece, mm -hmm. which is really a nice combination because sometimes when you're out on the internet, you don't always feel that connection. Right. And this allows that connection too. Um, so we talked about where they sign up and we'll put that up again at the end. Um, and we do want to mention that it is for Greater Nash Nashua. Mm -hmm. um, so the towns being, I'm just going to list them off since you made a list for me. Uh, Nashua, Milford, Hudson, Amherst, Brookline, Hollis, Litchfield, Lydenboro. I'm probably saying that wrong. Uh, Merrimack, Mount Vernon, Pelham, and Wilton. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of towns, a lot of kids out there. Um, so what else can you tell us about the program that you um, haven't told us yet? Or I could repeat some things. That's also an option. <laughs> Um, really, we're just so excited that this is an opportunity that we're able to pass on to Nashua's four-year-olds and their families. Um, it's really going to set kids up for school success. I mean, we are hoping to reach children who have barriers to their school success. So um, children in low-income households, children with language barriers. Um, but really, anyone who feels like their kids can um, benefit from this program should apply. And because, you know, we may have space available and we just love to know that there's interest and uh, there's one other thing I wanted to say about it. Oh, if you're already involved in a preschool program, that's okay, you can do both. It's a benefit for anyone who wants to participate. So if your child's already in preschool, this can be supplemental. Right, so and conversely, if you're not comfortable with sending your child to preschool right now because of the pandemic, this is a great opportunity to have like a mini preschool at home, absolutely. Um, you know, 15 minutes. And then, like you said, they can extend their activities. They can add to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great option for them as well. Um, do you have anyone enrolled yet? Uh, last I heard, which is a little outdated because we update on Fridays, uh, there are 18 children enrolled so far. Okay, so lots um, of space. Lots left. of space. And also, as people enroll and don't need the internet access, that frees up a little bit of funding. So we can roll that into more spots. Okay. So we're able to enroll a large number of children. All right, that's great. So um, 
is there a deadline for enrollment or can you start this at any time during the school year? There is a deadline of October 30th, but what we are asking people to do is sign up as soon as possible because we need to get you your laptop mm -hmm. if you need internet access installed. That all takes time. Um, and then everyone will start after the October 30th date. Okay, so we have so we have a little bit of time, but if, um, encourage parents to sign up now. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to give a shout out again of that phone number, that would yes, be great. I would love to. And also not just the phone number and the um, sign up, but if there's a provider, if you run a daycare or if you, um, you know, work in a doctor's office and you feel like you might have, you might be coming into contact with people or have access to people who could um, benefit from this program, you can email me and I will get you a handful of flyers in any language you want. Well, maybe not any language, um, not Pig Latin. We don't have that. Um, not yet. But <laughs> we could get it. Um, so my email address is Davies P as in Pamela, because that's my name, at nashua.edu. Okay, and, and we'll that's, also put that up at the end. Great, that's for providers if they um, want to reach out for uh, more information. But for parents who want to enroll, the phone number is 1-888-982-9898, or you can go to waterfordupstart.org slash register. All right, so thank you so much, Pamela, for telling us about this program. It's very exciting. Uh, I mean, it's such a great opportunity for people with young children to get um, to really get a leg up on mm -hmm. school and to do it in a structured way, but it's not a huge time commitment. Um, you end up with a laptop at the end of the year as well, mm -hmm. um, which is, I gotta tell you, when you're in school right now, you absolutely have to have technology um, all the way up. It's just, it's not gonna change, I don't think, even after we uh, can fully enroll kids back into school full time. So right. I think it's great to have um, the access to the technology and to the internet access as well. Um, and we can hopefully, as you said, level the playing field for a lot of our students in Nashua in need. So thank you and um, have a great weekend, everybody.